six of our crossword series on the letters to John. Today is 1 John 3, 19 to 4, 6. So chapter 3, verses 19 to chapter 4, verse 6. Session 6. Last week we had heard about the believer, and the believer being uh, described as being born of God. Uh, and, and to be frank, you know, being born, sort of being born into the families, you know, uh, definitely has the idea that it's a much stronger connection and relationship than just uh, an, an acquaintance. We talked about Christ uh, and, and sin being completely incompatible, like oil and water. And so avoiding our sin helps our lives, and that makes it possible for us to, to flourish as humans, loving not just by our words, but with our actions and, and our deeds. So this next section that we're getting in today, there's sort of two main uh, pieces to it. So the first one, chapter 3, verses 19 through 24, and then the first part of chapter 4. This end part of chapter 3 that we're looking at, it's all about having the confidence and assurance that even if we don't feel God's love, or even, even if we don't feel that we are fully living it rightly, or feel that we are with Christ, we have some uh, affirmation and assurance that if we obey and believe, then God is going to be with us too, that it'll be all, all good, if you will. Then chapter 4 uh, is sort of discerning between what is true and what is error, what is wrong, about listening critically and not being deceived or led astray by any of the, the false prophets in the world. So with these two distinct sections in mind, we'll unpack the first a little bit more. It's all about love. Again, this is 1 John chapter 3, 19 to 24. Love is the final end point for us as humans. Part of that, we have to have a, a, a right understanding of what love actually is. Uh, obviously, it's much more than just having uh, a certain affinity or having a certain uh, preference or what you like. Like, I like ice cream a lot. I mean, I would say that I love it, but true love in the Christian sense is more focused upon loving others and putting other things and other people first. And that's obeying Christ's command. Um, it's getting at having a certain confidence in your prayers, and that comes from obedience. And it's sort of a self-fulfilling, self-reinforcing cycle. The challenge presented in this uh, section uh, gets at our conscience. When it says, uh, uh, the heart might condemn us, that's referring to the conscience. But John writes that the all-powerful God knows us, and knows us better than ourselves. And since God knows us all the better, and he is rich in mercy to forgive us, he knows what's actually on our heart, even if we don't feel it at the time. There's a difference between how we might judge ourselves, and then how God judges us. God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. That's from Hebrews 4. He sees all and knows all, and then forgives because he loves. The encouragement is that faith in Christ and love of our neighbor is so inexplicably tied together, almost like a covenant that you can't have one, you can't have one without the other. And it's sort of the same concept as practicing what you preach. Almost like fake it till you make it, even though I don't like that phrasing perfectly. But there is some truth that if you actually love God and love our neighbor, love your neighbor with your deeds, with your actions, and then your conscience, how you feel about the rest of the world and how uh, everything you see outwardly, that will change your perception by actually loving and serving others. And if your conscience, or just you, uh, feels like you're not doing enough, this passage is assuring us that, that it is, that God, that, that, uh, that God knows and sees what's actually in our heart, even if you feel like you could have done more. Um, he knows that 
where your intention was, and that's, and that's the most important thing. Uh, there's a, a beautiful quote that says it a little bit more succinctly than I might, but also a little bit more elevated. This, this is from Thomas Aquinas. If the sin of the heart is great, greater is God's compassion in forgiving. And God, too, is greater than our heart, because he alone satisfies the desires of our heart and even overflows and surpasses them. And I love that last piece of, of him satisfying and even all, uh, uh, overflowing and surpasses everything imaginable uh, is just a beautiful image. The last portion here sort of is getting at uh, abiding, us abiding with God and how the Spirit interacts, the Holy Spirit interacts with us. Those who abide in Jesus know that they are abiding in Jesus because of the presence and assurance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul, Paul says this similarly in Romans chapter 8, which says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And just before that, he said that anyone who belongs to Jesus has the Spirit in him. And that the, the indwelling, the sort of, a, the, that's a technical term for the, the Holy Spirit physically being in you, gives us some, some assurance. You can't be abiding in Jesus and not know it, although you may doubt um, or may feel some doubt of it. To know if you really have this uh, presence or assurance can take some uh, spiritual discernment on, on our parts. But God has already given us another way to see it and to have some confidence in it, seeing if we love one another. If you can honestly say that you love others, love your neighbor, if you can feel it, you can live it, that's supposed to be this affirmation of uh, our relationship with, with God, that if you can love others, then your relationship with God is going to be equally loving and reflective. So that's the first section. Now to chapter 4. We immediately see there's all this mention of spirit and spirits. There's a contrast between supernatural powers claimed by false prophets and then what the Holy Spirit does. The mention of spirits um, should, should immediately... Uh, tick some little bell in our mind of earlier in chapter 2 when John was talking about these antichrists and all these false prophets. And so he's getting back to that. Um, there's some other portions of Scripture that I, I, I find helpful to understand more fully what John is getting at. And the first passage that comes to mind is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Which simply says to, to test everything and hold, to hold fast to what is good. Which is simply encouraging us to be very mindful and present to what we listen and what we read and what we take in. And then compare it with the rest of scripture. And Paul in 1 Corinthians echoes uh, this but, but describes it in, in the form of a, a spiritual gift. He's listing different gifts of what are given of knowledge and faith and all these things and healing. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 10. And he specifically mentions the ability to distinguish spirits, which is specifically what John is getting at. That there's different people sort of influencing the world and influencing you potentially. There's an important concept in theology, and particularly scriptural study of, of how we examine and what we learn from Scripture. That when we dive really deeply in and focus in on one particular verse, which is a good thing, there's a, a trap that we want to avoid, which is not forgetting that there's, you know, a whole bunch of other books of Scripture. And, and so much of a, a wealth of, uh, of teaching and examples of who God is and our relationship with Him. That if we take one little verse totally out of context, 
uh, then we can get ourselves into trouble. So to know God, that, meaning, uh, that means knowing actually who he is. The question is, how do we know who he is? Well, I'm going to tell you frankly to just go read some more scripture. Reading the Old Testament, seeing how he provides and cares for Israel time and time again. He makes a covenant and then he's consistent. And that's part of his very nature. And that's something we believe about scripture that it is consistent and doesn't contradict itself. And so when we hear something in the world, whether it be, I mean, from any sort of source, whether it be on social media or radio or news or anything, the, the, the task we have is to compare that with what we know to be true in Scripture. And if they don't, if they aren't compatible, then we know that that is something, uh, at the very least, to be wary, if not something to quite quickly turn away from. And John, in 1 John, throughout it, he talks a lot about false teaching. Again, it's mentioned many times, and it's never quite explicitly stated exactly what false teaching he's referring to. Um, and it's been you know, thought that it could be referring to all these different groups um, in the first century or so, of Jews or Gnostics or these other sects of all these sorts of weird people that are following Roman gods of Saturnus or Valentinus. Who, who, who knows? The point is that we, we do know that, that everything that he's referring to is sort of falling under two categories. So there's false teaching that is uh, teaching falsely about Christ and who Christ is. And then there's the, the, the people that are teaching immoral things. So some are denying that Christ, uh, that, that Jesus was Christ, or that he was actually the Son of God, and, or that Christ actually came in the flesh, or that Jesus became possessed at his baptism, or all sorts of weird things. But the point is, these were real people with, with tangible arguments in the present time there. And the moral opponents were trying to claim that you could not be in fellowship with God if, if all of your actions didn't match up. Or someone claimed that a, a true Christian could not sin at all. Well, I know that I sometimes stumble, so I know that that can't quite be true. Um, we also know that most of these heresies sprouted up from, from within the church and not from outside. Um, it could have been groups of people. It, it wasn't necessarily people trying to hinder or throw some, you know, monkey wrench in the wheel of Christianity. Um, but there's a recognition that there are other forces in the world that are trying to lead us astray. So in the text when it says, He who is in the world, that's a specific mention or idea of the devil. John is pointing out sort of two streams or two influences to humanity, that of the church and then that of the world. When he says, he that is in you, that's Christ, that's God. And then that is compared uh, with he that is in the world, which is evil. We have overcome every such antichrist by the grace of Christ because he is greater. In verse 5, there's this great description of the world and why we have to be cautious, why we have to be intentional and, and somewhat wary and discerning. The others, the heretics, the antichrist, what have you, are all guided and informed by this worldly spirit. By the let, by anything less than good, <clears throat> excuse me, by, by selfishness. They are in the world's echo chamber that promotes everything possible except God and righteousness, what we know to be true. <clears throat> excuse me. Of living for oneself, desiring power, status, and wealth, all of which we know is not in not uh, co consistent with, with Scripture. See verse 6. We Christians 
us <clears throat> are of God. We've received the Holy Spirit, and following in the lineage of the apostles, we're literally sent by Christ, that becomes our connection to God. They who uh, serve God and obey the doctrine of Christ, they are our teachers to preserve all Christians from, from error and from wrong teaching of the world. <clears throat> There's this idea that what we believe is sort of passed on by the tradition of the church, which we believe is to be inspired by the Holy Spirit all the way through, and that is in theory supposed to give us some comfort. Augustine describes, describes it like this. <clears throat> For heretics who are led by the spirit of error teach things of the world. But the apostles and the apostolic doctors, the first bishops of the church who are born of God, teach things divine. Immediately when I hear that, one of those sounds much nicer than the other. I want to hear things divine. That sounds pretty neat to me. So the encouragement to be discerning, to be mentally strong and critical in how we, how we live, if you hear something, we're asked to compare it to Scripture. In the, in the study guide this week, John Stott put it really well, I think. True faith examines its object before reposing confidence in it. Behind every prophet is a spirit, and behind every spirit is either God or the devil. I think it bears some, uh, some, some time to reflect on how we take in information and how we examine where it's coming from and what it's trying to say, what it's trying to say about us or other people. We'd, we would do well to take some time to think very carefully about that. The reality is that we're all looking for some sort of, you know, secret truth or magic, you know, magic answer to everything. That all self-help books or videos uh, or TikToks even try to claim that they have something special to really help you. This is the one thing you need to unlock whatever it is in your life. This will change your life. Um, uh, a couple months ago, my wife and I went down a rabbit hole of... of reading everything we could find on Scientology because we found it so bizarre and just wild the story of even like the creation of the founder and he's just like a really weird dude that it was just like so fascinating to see like how absurd it really was um, but also tragic because how it's destroyed so many lives but there's this weird pressure to to keep on throwing money at it so that you could you know, make your way to some sort of weird enlightenment phase. Um, and it, it was all very bizarre, but it was fascinating. And so we started reading up on more like cults and seeing just, you know, this trend of how uh, it's a normal condition that people want to be a part of something special and want to be, uh, want to help, want to be helped. They want to grow in some specific way. But uh, what we saw from the outside is that there were all these warning signs uh, that these little groups were not something to be trusted. Um, and I don't know quite how I got there, but if you want to talk about cults, it was really fascinating. Um, anyway, but it's a reminder, this is why it came to mind, it's a reminder for us to be disciplined in, in where we stand and where, where we look out at the world, of how we interact and what we take in, because what you listen and read or take in uh, that, that will shape how you think and how you feel. Yeah. But the only you know, true life-giving secret to the world is, of course, the, the perfect, giving, loving, sacrificial love of Christ, which is offered only as a gift to us, which is the most perfect thing we could hope for. So next week, session seven, is more on God's love and how He loves us, and how we know that he loves us. So I hope the groups are going well. My prayer for you this week is that uh, God would make his presence in your life felt, powerfully known that you would actually feel it and recognize it 
and respond. So God bless you this week.